Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about the physiology of vomiting. Now, vomiting is also known as emesis and throwing up, amongst many other terms. And it is an involuntary, forceful expulsion of the contents of one's stomach, essentially through the mouth. We will look at the so-called emetic reflex, which is the vomiting reflex. And in order to understand the vomiting reflex, we need to talk about the brain. So here is the brain and the brain stem. There's an area of the brain stem called the medulla oblongata, where we find what's called the vomiting center. The vomiting center contains essentially muscarinic receptors, types of receptors. And when these receptors are stimulated within the vomiting center, this will trigger the vomiting reflex. So the process of vomiting. Close to the vomiting center, also near the medulla oblongata of the brainstem, is another area called the chemoreceptor trigger zone, or CTZ for short. Now, the CTZ, as the name suggests, gets triggered by chemicals. And the CTZ contains a few types of receptors, and these are the dopamine 2 receptors and the 5-HT receptors. 5-HT essentially is serotonin. So these are serotonin receptors. It's easy to remember CTZ because we know that chemotherapy stimulates this chemoreceptor trigger zone. So when the chemoreceptor trigger zone, the CTZ, is stimulated, it will then stimulate the muscarinic receptors of the vomiting center. And when the muscarinic receptors of the vomiting center are stimulated, this will cause the vomiting reflex, the emetic reflex. Though the chemoreceptor trigger zone is located in the medulla, like the vomiting center, the chemoreceptor trigger zone is located conveniently outside the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier is a barrier preventing circulating substances in the blood from making contact with the brain um, and areas of the brainstem. Because the chemoreceptor trigger zone is situated outside the blood-brain barrier, it is thus more permeable to circulating substances such as cytotoxic agents, chemotherapy. Motion sickness is a very common thing people experience. And the cause of motion sickness actually comes from the inner ear, a bony structure called the labyrinth. The labyrinth is made up of many areas, one of which is called the vestibule a structure important for balance in space. Problems here will send electrical signals to the brainstem via the vestibular cochlear nerve. And the signals will get sent to an area specifically in the brainstem called the vestibular nuclei, which is located in the pons of the brainstem. The vestibular nuclei contain histamine 1 receptors and also muscarinic receptors. So when the vestibular nuclei is stimulated during, let's just say, motion sickness, or during also morning sickness, these signals will then be passed on to the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And from here, the chemoreceptor trigger zone will then send signals to the vomiting center in the medulla oblongata to trigger the vomiting reflex. Another cause of vomiting are things that occur from the cerebrum or the brain after it has processed all this sensory information. So what I mean is that, for example, when people are emotionally overwhelmed or when people are in severe pain or when they smell something really bad or they see something repulsive, something really bad, essentially all this stuff will get sensed by the brain, by the higher centers of the brain. And from the higher brain centers, this will then, this, this signal will then travel down to the vomiting center to stimulate the vomiting center to initiate the vomiting reflex. This makes sense because some people get really nauseous when they see blood or guts or they smell something like a type of food that just smells horrible. Again, the higher brain centers stimulate the vomiting center through muscarinic receptors.
Other causes of vomiting occur in the stomach. So let's just recap some anatomy here. So we have the mouth, which connects to the esophagus, which will travel down through the diaphragm, which is the muscle, muscular structure. The esophagus will then join onto the stomach, and then the stomach joins onto the small intestine. If we were to zoom into the stomach, we can see they form deep pits, deep pits and glands. And these are lined up by many different types of cells, one of which are called enterochromaffin cells. The enterochromaffin cells release serotonin in response to cytotoxic agents, which is, also, which is thought to stimulate then um, 5-HT3 receptors on sensory nerve fibers around the area. And stimulation of this sensory nerve fiber, which is actually the vagal nerve, will bring this information to the vomiting center to trigger the vomiting reflex. In summary, all the causes of vomiting we talked about essentially will stimulate the vomiting center, which is the output from which the vomiting reflex or the emetic reflex is initiated. Let's focus on what the vomiting reflex is and actually what happens during the process. First, it actually causes the lower esophageal sphincter to relax, which makes sense because we need food to come up towards the mouth when we vomit. We also need the diaphragm to contract and also the abdominal muscles to contract so that it will help push the food back up. And this happens because we are increasing intra-abdominal pressure when we contract our muscles. There are also autonomic changes such as tachycardia, which is increase in heart rate, and we also increase salvation as well as peristalsis. The vomiting reflex also causes the epiglottis to close on, um, at the top part because we don't want food to travel down to the lungs. And once the vomiting reflex does all these things, then the vomit or the food, expulsion of food can uh, happen. So that was the physiology of vomiting, the emetic reflex, the vomiting reflex. Now let's talk about the medications that are used to treat, manage, and prevent nausea and vomiting in an acute as well as chronic situations. These medications are also known as anti-emetics, basically preventing emesis, preventing vomiting. And the different classes of antiemetics include histamine 1 receptor antagonists. Histamine 1 antagonists are also called the histamine uh, blockers, which include promethazine. Um, so they're also called antihistamines. And these class of medications actually just, they, as the name suggests, block histamine, specifically histamine 1 receptors. And these medications are actually commonly used to help relieve allergic reactions, but they are also effective in nausea and vomiting, specifically nausea and vomiting to do with motion sickness or morning sickness, as this diagram depicts. Then there is the 5-HT3 receptors antagonists. Remember these because they end in citron, so, and they include ondansetron. 5-HT, as we mentioned earlier in the video, is serotonin. So 5-HT3 receptors are serotonin receptors. And therefore, 5-HT3 receptor antagonists are serotonin receptor antagonists. And these medications are used to control nausea and vomiting by working at the chemoreceptor trigger zone, but also possibly the gastrointestinal tract, which we will talk about. Dopamine 2 receptor antagonists work on the chemoreceptor trigger zone and include a variety of subclasses, you can say. It's easy to remember this one concept that dopamine 2 receptor antagonists are also same or similar drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia or psychosis. So these dopamine 2 receptor antagonists can be subdivided into a few groups. The first group are, are the antipsychotics that end in azines. So, for example, procloperazine and clopromazine. 
And the second group is metoclopramide, which actually inhibits dopamine 2 receptors, but are thought to also stimulate gastrointestinal tract activity. The final group is droperidol, which also inhibits dopamine 2 receptors, similar, similar to um, haloperidol, and these guys are also used to treat schizophrenia. So those were the dopamine 2 receptor antagonist class. The fourth class are the muscarinic receptor antagonists, such as hyosin with a H. These guys block the receptors in the vomiting center, inhibiting the vomiting reflex. So let's look now at each of the antiemetic classes in a bit more detail and see what they're good for and see what the side effects are. Let's begin by looking at the histamine 1 receptor antagonists, such as promethazine. And these guys are good for motion sickness and morning sickness. The side effects of these drugs include drowsiness and sedation. The serotonin receptor antagonists, ending in cetron, such as ondansetron, are good antiemetics for patients undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, but also patients post-surgery as well. The side effects of these drugs include headache as well as gastrointestinal upset. Remember that these drugs can also work locally at the gastrointestinal tract, which we'll talk about. The next class is your dopamine 2 receptor antagonists, which are your antipsychotics, essentially. The first group are your antipsychotic groups that end in azines, such as prochlorperazine and clopromazine. And they are good antiemetic drugs for chemotherapy and radiation patients. They also block histamine and muscarinic receptors as well, which may be useful in certain situations. The side effects include sedation, hypotension, and extrapyramidal side effects. It's important to mention extrapyramidal side effects here because this is a side effect shared by a lot of of antipsychotic medications. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into metaclopramide, which is your next, essentially, group. So metaclopramide are, is good for chemo, chemotherapy radiation patients who have nausea and vomiting, as well as patients with uh, reflux and hepatobiliary disorders. The mechanism of action of metaclopramide, not only does it work as a dopamine 2 receptor antagonist, but it also works um, in the gut, increasing gut motility. The side effects of metoclopramide, other than uh, gastrointestinal upset, include extrapyramidal side effects. Extrapyramidal side effects, as mentioned, is a common side effect in antipsychotic medications. And these extrapyramidal side effects include acesthesia, which is restlessness, tardive dyskinesia, spasmodic torticollis, ocular gyrus crisis, and also it can also increase prolactin levels, which can result in galacteria, menstrual problems, as well as more lactation. Droperidol is your sort of other group of dopamine 2 receptor antagonists, and these are also antipsychotics as well. And they these drugs are good for acute chemotherapy-induced vomiting. Doperidol is also used in surgery for post-operative nausea and vomiting. So now focusing on the stomach area, remember that we talked about the serotonin receptor antagonists, the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. Well, they can also work locally in the gut because there are serotonin receptors on sensory nerve fibers here. And so... What happens is that ondansetron, for example, can work locally here. Thus, ondansetron is often used in pregnancy for those with bad nausea and vomiting, although it is not recommended in the first trimester. And there are some conflicting sort of evidence, you can say. Finally, the muscarinic receptor antagonists or anticholinergics such as heosin with a H are good as prophylaxis for certain conditions and situations, as well as for motion sickness. Side effects of these medications include having a dry mouth, blurry vision, and drowsiness. 
it's easy to remember these side effects because they are anticholinergic side effects. And remember Alice in Wonderland for the anticholinergic syndrome. The muscarinic receptor antagonists are good as prophylaxis and for treating motion sickness because they also work at the vestibular nuclei, which is where the whole process is, if you remember. So that, that concludes the video on uh, the pharmacology of um, vomiting. So that concludes the video on the pharmacology of antiemetics. There are obviously other antiemetics used, which I have not mentioned, but this is the overall group and classes. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.